What the heck are Maxwell's equations? I mean, you see these things and people talk about them and they put them on t-shirts, but what the heck are they? Okay, I'm gonna walk you through these. It's a little scary, but don't worry. We're gonna do this. You don't need to know calculus, although they actually deal with a lot of calculus. So just hold on to your pants here. We're gonna do it. Okay, so the, here you see the four Maxwell equations. I, you might see them on a t-shirt, you might see them on the internet, they're used in jokes, so you really have to know at least a basic idea about what these are. Don't worry, I'm going to go through each one and let's get started. Number one, Gauss's Law. Okay, so there are two forms for every single one of these equations. There's the integral form and the differential form. So on the left here I have the integral form and on the right the differential form. And it, it doesn't really matter, okay. The, I like the integral form because it deals with things that you can kind of uh, see a little bit better, but they deal with finite forms. Okay, so I don't really want to go into too much. I'm not going to talk about the differential forms at all, but I'll just tell you right now. This says the closed integral of e dot n hat dA, which is the flux, that's the surface integral, even though it doesn't look like it, is equal to the total charge over inside that divided by epsilon naught. Okay, let me, that didn't make any sense, but really this is what it's about. Boom, you know, I was really happy I found this picture. I was like, I need a picture of like static electricity or something electric. And I thought, what about hair? I don't want to Google it. And so I tried to find a picture. I knew I took a picture of my kids with their hair sticking straight up. This is my youngest kid. He went down the slide and boom, look at that. And so that kind of gives you an idea about the electric field. There's a lot going on there though. So, but it's a picture. I got to use my kid. There you go. So what Gauss's law really says is that electric charges make electric fields. And I'm actually going to call these a Coulomb field. So if I have a positive charge, then this makes a Coulomb field that points radially away from the positive charge in all directions, and it decreases with distance from the charge. If I have a negative charge, then these electric fields point towards the, towards the negative charge. And, as we all know, positive charges are red and negative charges are blue, and, and I'm just kidding. Okay, that's just that's just my little joke. Okay, so that's how do we use Gauss's law. So suppose I take this charge and now it's black. I had because I, I took this picture from a book, um, and I draw an imaginary sphere around that charge. Then I can calculate the electric flux, which is that integral e dot n hat dA. That's how the electric field passes through that that surface. And the amount of electric field passing through that surface is directly related to the amount of charge in that surface. And so you can actually use this Gauss's law to directly get Coulomb's law, which tells you the electric field due to a point charge. And this is a scalar version, but, but that's it. So electric flux, go ahead and make your back to the future jokes. Um, but that's what it is. But I mean, I don't want to get in the math. I just want to say, still, Gauss's law says that point charges have these electric fields that radiate out from them. But what if you have more than one point charge? What if I have two point charges? If we have two point charges that have the same but opposite value, so plus a proton and an electron, okay, one's plus E and one's minus E, then we call that a dipole. If I put those two near each other, it makes a pattern of field that looks like this. These are this, I actually calculated this in Python and displayed it, uh, but this is the electric field as you move around a circle. And you can see on the left of the two charges is pointing towards the negative charge, and to the right it's pointing away, but it changes directions all over there. If I was able to plot the electric field in a lot of different places, it would look like this for a dipole. And you see this, this pattern in, in space. And now imagine I draw a sphere around these two charges. Well. The total charge inside of that sphere is zero. So that means that the flux has to be zero, and indeed it is. Look at the, the electric field on the right side of that circle. They're pointing out of the circle, so that would be positive flux. On the other side, we have the exact opposite, so it's negative flux. So as you go all the way around that circle, you get zero flux. No flux, I don't give a flux, and no charge inside. And that is exactly what Gauss's law says. Okay. And you may think, why? Who cares? You'll see. Okay, the next law is Gauss's law for magnetism. If you notice, it looks just like electric flux for Gauss's law. Electric, Gauss's law for electric 
fields, except it has a B instead of an E. So we use the symbol B to represent magnetic field. I have no idea why. There's probably a reason. So but this says the only difference is on the right side, there's no charge. So it says the magnetic flux is zero. Okay, what does that really mean? Here is a magnet. Actually, this is a two magnets stuck together. And I dumped iron filings around them. And you can see the shape that they make. And we have this magnetic field pattern. You should recognize, or at least maybe if you squint, you could say, hey, that looks like the electric field due to a dipole. And it does. It's the same pattern. Okay, But this is a magnetic field. So the flux around this magnet would be zero just like the dipole, because it's still the same integration. It's just B instead of E, okay? Well, well that's fine. I can make it, it non-zero by breaking this in half. So I took those two magnets and pulled them apart, so it's like breaking a magnet in half, and boom, you still get a dipole, okay? So no matter what, if you broke this magnet in half, which I didn't want to do, you'd still get a dipole field around it. It'd be a different field, but still dipole field. That means that if you surround the magnet, you get a zero flux. Here's another picture. Here's a magnet and the dipole field around it and uh, the flux in the circle is zero. So what this says is that you can't break a magnet apart into a positive magnetic charge and a negative magnetic charge. That's what you would need to get a non-zero magnetic flux. So really this says there are no magnetic monopoles. A mag magnetic monopole would be a, just a single charge. Uh, so. If you watch Big Bang Theory, they talk about magnetic monopoles. This is what they're talking about. It, it actually doesn't say that they don't exist. It says that we've never seen the magnetic flux not zero. If, if we found that not to be zero, then we'd say, oh, there's a magnetic monopole. Okay, and I'll review at the end, don't worry. Faraday's law. So this integral sign here looks similar, but it's not. The integral in Gauss's law was a surface integral. This is a line integral. And I know we're, we're physicists and we're lazy and we cheat, uh, but that's what this is. Okay, really we should draw it differently. But we know it's a line integral because it has dl, e dot dl. It doesn't have a dA for area. Okay. But this has, but on the right side, we have b dot n hat dA. That is the magnetic flux, but it doesn't have that circle on the integral because it's not a closed surface. Okay, let me just show you what it is and we'll get back to that. Here on the right is a coil of wire and the little meter on the left is a very sensitive current meter and it's hooked up to the coil of wire. And in my hand, I have a magnet. And you'll notice when I, when I move the magnet into the coil of wire, it creates a current. When I hold the magnet there, no current. When I pull the magnet out, current. Okay, so I can make electric currents with a magnet. Here's a description of what's going on. On the left here, I have a coil of wire. And inside that coil of wire, suppose I have a magnetic field. And the magnetic field is increasing. That's going to make an electric field in a loop around that, that gray loop right there. Okay. But this is a non-Coulomb electric field. It does not look like the same. And in fact, it's kind of making this circular shape. And I'm going to call it a curly electric field. So what makes a curly electric field? On the right, I have a diagram. It's the same thing. But I'm using the blue arrows with X's. Those are magnetic fields going into the page. OK, that's one way to draw them. And if they're changing, they would make a curly electric field. OK. So that's exactly what Faraday's law says. On the right is the electric flux over the surface, and then that's a derivative. So it's, it has to be a changing electric, a changing magnetic flux makes a curly electric field. And that's Faraday's law. Okay, one more law, and this one's a, the, save the best for last. The Ampere-Maxwell law. So really there was, Ampere's law, and then Maxwell fixed it. So now it's called the Ampere-Maxwell law. Uh, you'll notice some pieces in here are familiar. We have the closed integral of b dot dl instead of e dot dl, right? They come in pairs. We have two surface integrals and two line integrals. So this is the line integral for magnetic fields. Now on the right, we do have the electric flux, but not closed, okay? So let's just 
look at an example here. This actually says two things. There's two terms in here. Here is a battery and the wire running from the battery is running over a compass. And when I connect the compass to the batter, the wire to the battery, there's an electric current and it makes a deflection on the compass. So this says that an electric current, which is moving electric charges, makes a magnetic field. And you can see the influence of that magnetic field from the wire on the compass. Here is a picture of the, sh actually on the right, you see an actual wire running through a piece of paper and I have those same iron filings. And so you kind of get a shape of the pattern. It's kind of hard to do because you need a high current. Uh, but you get a curly magnetic field. So electric current makes a curly magnetic field. On the left, I have a calculation I did in uh, Python. And so that little yellow piece is a current segment. And it makes these blue arrows, which are the magnetic field, a curly magnetic field. Same shape as the curly electric field in Faraday's law. So you can make a curly electric field with moving charges. So you can also make, this is so cool, you can also make a curly magnetic field with a changing electric field. So this is just like Faraday's law except opposite, right? Faraday's law says changing magnetic field makes a curly electric field. This says a changing electric field makes a magnetic field. Boom, I mean, that's awesome. Okay, let's review, and then we have one more thing. So, Gauss's law. Electric point charges make electric fields. We call these Coulomb fields. Next, Gauss's law for magnetism, and I just realized I bolded that wrong, but you get the idea. There are no magnetic charges. There are no mag mon magnetic monopoles. There are no Coulomb-like magnetic fields. There's no magnetic fields that radiate from a point. That just doesn't happen. Faraday's law, a changing magnetic flux makes curly electric fields. And then finally, Ampere-Maxwell law, moving electric charges make curly magnetic fields. And, see there's two parts here, changing electric fields make curly magnetic fields. So there, there's some symmetry here, you know, but like Gauss's law for magnetism, there's none. And then, but there's moving charges can make a curly magnetic field and changing electric fields can make a magnetic field. Okay, so this is important for an electromagnetic wave. So imagine, imagine there was a region of space where I had an electric field perpendicular to a magnetic field. And that's what you see in this top picture up here. And now imagine that this region of space was moving to the right. There's nothing there but the electric and magnetic field. It turns out that if I put that Coil, uh, imaginary space there, then the changing electric flux would make that magnetic field. And then if I turn that little imaginary loop to the side, I get a changing electric flux, I get a changing magnetic flux makes a electric field. So this moving electric and magnetic field through Maxwell's equations kind of propagate themselves and they can move through space at the speed of light. It only works if this is moving at the speed of light. So light is an electric electromagnetic wave. So here are some examples of electromagnetic wave. You have the sun. Okay, that was kind of silly. Uh, up here is me with a bag over my head. You should never put a bag over your head. But if you do, you can see through it with an infrared camera. Infrared light is an electromagnetic wave. It just interacts differently with matter. And then finally down there, I have my favorite uh, radio generator uh, with a um, spark gap generator and you can build that yourself. So there you go. That's what elect that's electromagnetic waves, but that's also what Maxwell's equations are. And there is a lot of math and I skipped over it. There you go. The end. Bye.